there, there are a lot of things in this. Uh, by the way, uh, some of you know uh, where we are here. We're, we're in a big city down here. The Mediterranean is down here. And one of the things I was not taught in, in the university was um, I was not taught to tell society where to urbanize or build highways or so on like that. I was ta ta always taught where they should not do it, you know? And I thought, well, that's interesting, you know, because one of the services that we can provide for society is to find places that are good for development. And incidentally, cities are good for nature because if, if you dispersed everybody, it'd be like that sprawl model. So uh, after I knew this region, Muscle Manus, um, I recognized that there are five, uh, sorry, there were six places, these yellow places here, there's an early draft, that's quite, that's in the wrong location, should be about here. Uh, there's six places where we could urbanize very well without much environmental damage. And that's what I was after. Where could we urbanize? Where could we channel growth with minimal effects on the water, on the biodiversity, and so forth? Um, and so what I would say is, and, these are, and you'll notice that these are, five of them are satellite cities around here. Um, this is before I did the other book. Um, and so what I'd say is identify those places uh, and first get a local transportation system in place around them with public transport and second get a park system with local connections uh, and then let development go. Let it go creatively in whatever intelligent way there around those things. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, let me say one more thing in a moment about that. Um, yeah, I think there's enough there. The red dots, they asked me, where should, the, where should we have uh, high, uh, uh, underpasses and overpasses for wildlife crossing and for hikers and farmers? And I said, you want to do that in an urban region? See, see, yeah. Uh, and so the red dots, were, I was really surprised because I always think of them as out in remote areas. But in fact, in Catalonia, I saw seven of those exist already. They're overpasses there. But, you know, they're for farmers and other reasons. Um, okay. Now, this I wanted to show there. This is this uh, <laughs> plant ter territory. I'm sorry the minister isn't here because this came out of his ministry. Um, that, um, and I, I'm not going to worry about the details there. I just want to say, the question is, why do plans in an urban region? It's too big, it's too complicated, it's too costly. Why do a thing like that? Well, if you really are interested in a whole raft of reasons, then get my urban regions book, chapter 10 or thereabouts. I summarize the Barcelona plan. At the end of that, I have a set, the most interesting section to me. It, it's... Barcelona region two years later, and it's my reflections on the whole process of working with the people and working here and the results. But and, and so that's a really it's a really interesting kind of analysis of or reflections, I should say. But but let me just say here that um, some of the things uh, that were in the, my, my uh, academic sort of plan some years ago ended up in the government plan. Some of them. But what I like about it is, and I'll give you one example, is that, the, remember I showed you that satellite city thing, and this is a good place, these are good places? They like this, apparently, they like the idea of urbanizing around satellite cities, but they chose a somewhat different group of cities than I did. And I thought that was wonderful. It, their plan, it's not my plan. And, and they, they chose, so there's an idea that you put on the table, and then their implementation, I can't pile out extra on here, I'm a Norte Americano, that's the worst of all. Uh, and uh, and so, um, so there's a good reason. Let me say uh, one or two other things about that planning business. Um, the way I kind of did it, I, everybody says too costly, too complicated, and you can't, you can't do it. Um, so what I did, I thought of it as a puzzle where there are a whole lot of pieces. And if you put all the pieces together, all of a sudden, oh, voila. Uh, but each of the most, almost all the pieces could be implemented individually. But the pieces fit together into a whole. So, and that was kind of the way I envisioned this. But I, I had some other mechanisms to make sure it wasn't my plan, it was their plan. It was the Bathy plan. All right, um, I have about 15 minutes left according to my watch. Is that, is that right with the boss? Okay. Um, so here's Seoul, Korea. Here's another uh, design. Uh, this is t in 1977, I believe, it was in 1980 maybe. Um, and you see, this is the classic green belt. 
uh, London has a green belt, uh, Ottawa has half a green belt, and so forth. Um, so I had this, a colleague of mine gave, gave it to me, and so I went to my Landsat image, my, <laughs> I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it on the satellite images. It just isn't there. And I just, but I had the data for it, you know, how many acres, how many hectares, et cetera. Uh, and also 12 other Korean cities. So, well, it turns out that uh, <laughs> it was uh, a ring road, but then transportation corridors went through and cities were here and military areas there and, and commercial areas here and, and industry. And so now it's a ring of large parks around Seoul. And both of those are pretty interesting designs. The ring, or the, uh, the, um, the, the green belt is a pretty interesting design, but the problem here was it's like blowing up a balloon. You get so much pressure, eventually it breaks. And so the corridors went out like this, but still the ring of large park, Berlin kind of has that, and there's some other cities. That, uh, ring of large parks, there may be some advantages because if it's a, something like this, then obviously government has to manage it. But if it's a ring of large parks, then the centralized government may not manage it, but the, the local people, it may be closer to the local control and management and care and stewardship, may be more operating. Um, I'm gonna skip this. This is the kind of thing I'm doing now, right? I'm going inside a city. It's too complicated to explain right now. But it has to do with how many parks you have in a city and the shape of the boundary of the city. and. And, uh, and all kinds of interesting things. And I take those different uh, thing, uh, patterns and I evaluate each of them based on about 20 environmental and hydrologic variables. And I, I, and I do it on all kinds of things. This is the whole city uh, metropolitan area, but I also do it on housing developments and uh, road uh, street grids and blocks and um, even cracks in the sidewalk I, and cracks in the walls. I do that, it's really interesting. All right, now I wanna put this up. What's the good of all this greenery? I, I happen to like this old, as a, a summary from a larger image. Uh, some uh, forests in, in Germany, uh, you would know these, um, and more. Uh, and it just simply said, look, there are urban forests and here are six variables that are uses for society, of those urban forests. And the amount of black indicates how much use there is for that. So think, think, don't just think about biodiversity, think of a range of values to society of a, a, a little bit of green, or a bit, in this case, a large bit of green. Um, I also happen to like this. This is from Berlin, uh, an old, old, older study. It's the only study I know like this, and say, if anybody knows another, I'd love to have it right now. Uh, but what it is is about 30 or 40 green spaces or parks in Berlin. And, and the horizontal axis is how big they are, and the vertical axis has to do with the heat island effect. How much cooling effect do they get from a small park or a large park? And what's interesting is, if you're le a small park of less than 30 hectares, you get about one degree centigrade cooling in the center of that park. If you take a large park of more than 500 hectares there, you get about five degrees centigrade cooling and three degree in the middle sized ones, although there's a lot of variability in the middle sized ones for various reasons. Um, so that gives you a first cut at, at how you could cool a city. And um, I don't need to tell this group uh, the significance of that. This same study, uh, I don't think I have the image. No, I'm sure I don't. Yes, maybe I do. No. Uh, the same study says it's not just cooling the park. How far does that coolness extend into the city? And it shows for, some, a, a several, uh, shows for five parks uh, in the city. Uh, it goes several hundred meters and over a kilometer in certain cases. And they do it with strong wind, medium wind, and, he and heavy wind. They do it upwind and downwind. It's quite interesting. It, it still doesn't get at the question of how many parks and what sizes and how to arrange them. That answer, we don't have an answer for that yet. But this is the closest I, uh, I've gotten to that. And, and also, this has to do only with temperature. It'd be really interesting to do this also with hydrology and do this with biodiversity. And that's, you know, it's how do you design the green spaces of a city is what this is getting at. This happens to be for temperature. Now, 
for, this is a Dusseldorf. I got a bunch of German slides in here today for some reason. You like that, huh? <laughs> I, I like it too. <laughs> but you know, this is uh, for Dusseldorf. And this, this, uh, these people have uh, studied five different groups, four animal and, and plants. And, um, and so what they did is that they identified 38 habitats on the, on the vertical axis there. And I can't read them from here, but there are 38, all the habitats they could find in the city. And number, and this happens to be for butterflies there, and the top habitats have no butterflies or very few, and the bottom habitats have lots of species there. Exactly the same data show up for plants and the other three animal groups. And what's interesting to me about this, if you, if I, and I'm going to replot this, but if you take the, the uh, habitats at the top with very few species, those are the most designed, the most planned, the most intensively built, the parking lots and things like that. If you take the habitats at the bottom, those are mostly the habitats that are, the British would call neglected. These are the habitats that are, that are least planned, least designed, least managed, least maintained. And, um, and what's interesting is what that says to us. We are designing against nature. We are maintaining against nature. We are managing against nature. We are biodiversity. We are managing against it. And that pattern is, so I often say to my students, I say, well, suppose you knew that. Where would you go to find the highest biodiversity in your city? And when some the, the bright students say to the zoo. And, and they're, they're probably right. <laughs> but I, I put that aside. And, and the answer would be, you go to some little place that's overlooked by society, that's neglected there. And that's where your highest biodiversity is, probably is. So we can do better. We can design, plan, manage, and maintain better there. Um, I, I like this also. This is from San Diego. Um, and, uh, and they studied 35 uh, canyons or 35 green spaces. Actually, they're brown spaces in San Diego mostly. But, and they found a lot of native species in, in many of them and very few native species in the other groups. So I'm simplifying. A lot of native species and very few. The, 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 the parks, uh, the parks with few native species had a lot of house cats and raccoons, that group of things in the box over there, um, opossums and rats and cats and things like that. The, the uh, parks with a lot of biodiversity of native species had very few of those house cats and raccoons, but instead it had a predator, coyote, coyote. Uh, it had the predator. And the significance is that the coyote doesn't eat the eggs and the, and the babies of the native birds and mammals. The coyote eats the cats and the rats and the, and the foxes and things like that. Chipmunk, uh, possum, it uh, chases the foxes away. Uh, and so having the coyote increased dramatically the native biodiversity in the parks of San Diego. Uh, so don't overlook predators as a very interesting and nice con uh, control mechanism for biodiversity. And there are a lot of, there's a lot, I mean, this happens to be the only study I know in cities. There's a lot of good science uh, of other types for that. Okay, now I've got about four or five slides of connectivity here. This is Toronto, 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 gosh, I've been in Spain too long. Um, and and so these are, these are proposed uh, greenways or corridors there um, in Toronto. And basically what they, uh, as I understand it, what they did was they identified, um, uh, it's actually a combination with, with a half uh, um, green, green belt. So you see this line along here, that's a ridge. And then there's another ridge down here. So, there's a, so they're, they're taking these two ridges and saying that's a green belt, we'll, we'll become a green belt. As, as they graduate. And then there are a whole lot of sort of like ramblas in, in Barcelona so coming down from the ridge down to the, to the sea, to the, sea to, the, to the lake there. And so the, that's a, the network of proposed, and some of them exist, uh, of proposed uh, corridors for nature and for people. And so it's a regional approach, but as you can see, the city will gain an enormous amount from it. And some of those exist, uh, quite a few of them exist actually. 